Uh, so now let's welcome up our speaker um, and get to know him a bit more. So help me welcome Ben Wood. Hi, Ben. Hi. So you're a pastor at St Barnabas up in Croydon and you've got a lovely wife and four kids. Um, at the store today, we've been asking people uh, to describe themselves in three words. How would you describe yourself in three words? Christine gave me a warning of this, and again, I haven't um, thought about it. So, three words. Hmm. Can I cheat? I'm a, a child of God. All right, that's a good one. Um, so, in light of the topic um, of finding hope and discovering oneself, as a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? And if it wasn't a pastor, as you are today, um, how did, and when did you come to discover this? When I was seven... It was 1984, and that was an Olympic year. It was the Los Angeles Olympics, and that was an absolute kind of period of glory for Great Britain. Uh, in the 1500 meters, there were three British runners in the final, uh, Sebastian Coe, Steve Ovette, and Steve Cram. Do those names mean anything to anyone? No. <sighs> These are legends. Uh, and they could have come one, two, three. They ended up going one, two, and Steve Ovette had to drop out. But um, uh, Sebastian Coe won, and I watched that, and I just thought, I want to be like him. Uh, absolute hero. And so I wanted to be a runner um, from age seven. And that kind of continued until about five years ago. Um, I spent a lot of time running. Uh, then um, then I, I kind of had a thought of becoming a pastor when I was about 14. Soon after I'd become a Christian, I thought, how can I serve Jesus? Uh, most obvious answer to that was become a, uh, a pastor. So I thought about it then. Uh, then I studied engineering and thought, oh, I can't be a runner. I'll end up being an engineer. And then, uh, yeah, I guess it was during my time at university, I realized I was... Um, uh, uh, I enjoyed engineering, but I wasn't really passionate about it. But I was really passionate about uh, serving Jesus and his people. And so it was soon after university I started doing what's called a ministry apprenticeship, uh, working for the church that I was a part of in London, and then went to Bible college and then came here. Great. Thanks, Ben. Sounds like quite a process, but thanks for sharing with us. We'll hear more from Ben when he um, shares a talk later on. Um, but now I'd like to welcome up uh, another student, one of our members, Dane, who is going to come up and read the passage we are looking at today. Uh, this week we'll be looking at the book of Mark, one of the eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life. You should all have a copy of this on your seat. Uh, now, if you've got a red copy of the Mark, please open to page 26. And if you've got a green copy, please open to page 31. Once you've opened up, look for the big number eight for the chapter and the little number 27 for the verse. Thank you, Dane. All right, from Mark 8:27, Jesus and his disciples went to the, to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. That he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke pl plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciple, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then when he called the crowd along to him, along with his disciples, and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. For what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in the Father's glory and the holy angels.
thing. Great. <clears throat> Is that working? Cool. Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, thinking about identity today, discovering myself. Um, this is going to make sense, given what I shared with Christine. Uh, when I was at the end of high school, I was given a T-shirt, uh, and it said, Life is running. Uh, I didn't particularly like it. It was a bit too big. Uh, but also, I wasn't sure about what it said. Uh, it was true. I was spending an awful lot of my time uh, running and doing quite well. But um, I wasn't sure I wanted to be defined by running. Uh, the t-shirt had come from a stall in the West End of London, and there were lots of different options. Life is dot, 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 food, or life is music, life is family, life is football. Which t-shirt would you have chosen? Or if you could design your own, what would it say? Life is what? How do you define yourself? What do you look to for meaning and fulfillment? In this passage of Mark's Gospel, Jesus addresses this issue of identity. He says in verse 35, Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the Gospel will save it. And when he uses that word life, it's the word psyche, uh, and it's more than physical life. He's talking about a person's personality, a person's identity, your unique sense of self. And he says, uh, just following that, that uh, this personality, this identity is something really precious. Uh, even if you could gain the whole world, it wouldn't be worth doing that if you were going to lose your identity. Jesus wants us to find an identity and one that is secure. So I'm going to try and unpack uh, something of what Jesus says under three ideas. They're on your sheets. Uh, the problem with a performance-based identity, the challenge of seeing Jesus' identity, and the call to find your identity in him. So firstly, the problem with a performance-based identity. We all need identity. We, we all desperately want to find a sense of worth. In uh, traditional cultures, uh, that sense of worth came from your role in the community. In traditional cultures, you often don't have much choice in what you do in life. Uh, if you come from a family of bakers, you're going to be a baker. Like it or lump it. Uh, you accept the roles and duties given to you and you are honored. You receive honor and affirmation in the community when you fulfill those roles and duties. Now for many of us that sounds incredibly oppressive and uh, restrictive, doesn't it? But at least it's simple. You know what you need to do, and if you do it faithfully, then you are affirmed by the community you belong to. In modern individualistic cultures like our own, the way of gaining a sense of self is quite different. Now, we're told, don't conform to any uh, requirements placed upon you. Be true to yourself. Look inside. Be who you want to be, and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Don't try and get your affirmation from other people. Just affirm yourself. Uh, this approach is expressed brilliantly in the movie Frozen. Elsa sings, It's time to see what I can do to test the limits and break through. No right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. Let it go, let it go. And, and we hear that and we, we kind of cheer internally, don't we? Because in our culture, there's something heroic about being true to yourself. Breaking free from the restrictions of tradition. And we've got to say there is something good about this modern approach to identity and the freedom that it's given people to escape from being stuck in a particular social stratum. However, there are also difficulties with this modern approach. I want to uh, just look at two briefly. Firstly, uh, there's the problem that while there is this freedom that freedom can actually create great anxiety. I don't know if you resonate with this. You know, in the past, as I said, you, you kind of knew who you were. Your role in life was largely given to you. But now you need to discover it for yourself. The world's your oyster, we're told. But that choice can be quite overwhelming. And when we're told that there are no limits, well, 
the expectation implicit in that is that we're going to do something amazing with our lives. It's not enough to just be faithful in whatever role you have. You've got to do something brilliant. You've got to be successful. Secondly, while we're told not to worry what anyone else thinks, just affirm yourself, the reality, and I hinted at this yesterday, the reality is we can't do that. Uh, We can't just say to ourselves, I don't care that everyone else in the world thinks I'm worthless. I love myself and that's all that matters. That wouldn't work, would it? Uh, We need someone, somebody from outside of us to affirm us and to tell us that we have worth. And the greater that somebody, the greater the power of their affirmation in our lives. And so even when modern people claim to be simply affirming themselves, it may be true they've left their family or community that they grew up in, but they'll always find a a new community to belong to who can give them the, the affirmation that they crave and need. So the reality is, in both traditional and modern individualistic cultures, Our identity comes from two related things. It comes from our performance and our achievements, and it comes from the acceptance and approval that we get from others. In traditional cultures, it's found in fulfilling our duty and the respect and honor that we get from our family and community. In uh, individualistic cultures, it's found uh, in things like pursuing career or uh, sporting achievements or body image and the acceptance and affirmation and Facebook likes of whoever is in our circle of significant others. Does that make sense? Two things that give us our sense of identity, our performance, achievements, and the acceptance and approval of others. In the first uh, Rocky movie, have have people seen that? Kind of dates me again. Um, Rocky, if you haven't seen it, let me um, fill you in. Sylvester Stallone plays this guy, Rocky Balboa, and he's a bit of a nobody. Uh, He lives in the American town of Philadelphia, and he's part of a small boxing club. But then he gets a shot at the world boxing title. You know, this could only happen in a Hollywood movie. He he gets the chance to fight the current world boxing champion, Apollo Creed. And just before the fight, Rocky says to his friend, all I want to do is go the distance. Nobody's ever gone the distance with Creed. And if I can go that distance and that bell rings and I'm still standing, then I'm going to know for the first time in my life that I'm not just another bum from the neighborhood. Can you hear what he's saying? If I can do this thing, then I'll know I'm a somebody, not just another bum. His whole sense of worth is tied up in his performance in the boxing ring. And it drives him to extreme lengths. You know, one of my favorite bits in the movie is the, the, the training uh, piece where you know, you've got inspirational music and he's doing endless push-ups one-handed and he's drinking raw eggs and he's running through the streets of Philadelphia and up the stairs and all of that. And you're just like, yes! But obsessive training and, and he makes sacrifices and he kind of neglects important relationships all in pursuit of the success that would give him that sense of worth and identity. And of course, he does go the distance, and it's wonderful. But you've got to wonder, for Rocky, what would have happened if he hadn't? What would that have done to him? As another example, uh, I read recently an article about work. It said, over the past century, in uh, Western society, our conception of work has shifted dramatically from a job to a career to a calling, from necessity to status to meaning. So as an example, Jimmy is a lawyer here in Adelaide. He graduated from the uni about six years ago, and he's now a high-flying corporate lawyer. He said recently to a friend, I don't think of myself as someone who just practices law. I am a lawyer. That's my identity. That's where I locate my meaning and purpose in life. When work becomes the thing that gives you your sense of meaning, then like Rocky, you'll go to extreme lengths to serve your work, to achieve success and gain the approval of your boss. 
You'll make sacrifices for it. You'll sacrifice your health, maybe. You'll sacrifice relationships. Uh, You might even sacrifice your integrity because your very identity is tied to your work. Uh, The T-shirt that I was given said, life is running. And like I said, I hardly ever wore it. But the reality is, if I'm honest, there was a period in my life when that was completely true. Uh, My worth and value rose or fell depending on the times of my latest training session and the result of my last race. I loved the admiration and respect that I received from others for my sporting ability and achievements. And there were actually a couple of times when I dropped out of important races because I could see I wasn't going to get the result that I wanted. And I thought, better to drop out and claim that I was unwell rather than get a result that would have been humiliating. For me, my identity was very much tied to my running. But what is it for you? What is it that gives you your sense of worth? What's the thing that, if it was taken away from you, would leave you devastated? Leave you thinking, I I don't have any more reason to live. It it could be uh, your work, your career, or your future career. Could be your family, could be your achievements, could be your body image, could be a particular relationship. Now those aren't wrong things in themselves, not at all. But but when they become the the basis of your identity, the thing that gives you your sense of worth, then you're asking them to do something they were never intended to. And here's the thing, any performance-based identity is inherently unstable. Any performance-based identity is inherently unstable. Can you see that? Because whatever you place your sense of worth in, and and whoever you look to for approval, can be taken away. I mean, what, what happens if Jimmy loses his job? What happens if you fail to fulfill your dream? What happens if uh, you disappoint your parents or your boyfriend rejects you? Can you see, whatever you put your identity in can be lost. And that's the problem with a performance-based identity. Jesus says the only secure identity is found in him. And to understand that and what that looks like, we need to understand who Jesus is himself. So that's the second point, the the challenge to see Jesus' identity. Uh, This passage in Mark is is right at the the center of the whole story. And and what we learn here is that Jesus is the king who died for us. Jesus is the king who died for us. Uh, When we grasp that, we'll be very close to finding a secure and satisfying identity. In this section, Jesus asks us one big question. Who do you say I am? Now, in even asking this question, Jesus is very different to every other religious leader. Buddha, Confucius, Muhammad, they never walked around talking like this, kind of giving so much attention to themselves. They talked about pointing people to God, showing people the path to enlightenment. They never talked like this. Effectively, Jesus is saying, this is what it all boils down to. This is the crucial question. What do you think of me? The disciples uh, give a couple of popular answers. Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. Others say you're one of the prophets. The disciples are saying, look, Jesus, people think you're right up there. You're one of the all stars. But Jesus isn't satisfied by that. He asks them, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up for all of them when he answers, Jesus, you are the Messiah. Now that word Messiah uh, is a title. It was a title that was given to Israel's king. But Peter's saying more than that. He isn't just saying, Jesus, you're a king. He's saying, Jesus, you are the king. The king of kings, the king over all other rulers. You are the one that God promised, 
who would save the world and bring an end to evil and injustice and usher in an era of righteousness and peace. And did you notice Jesus takes it? He doesn't say to Peter, no, 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 you've got it all wrong. I'm not that special. No, he takes it. Now, we said before, to have a sense of worth, we need somebody outside of us to affirm us. And the greater that somebody, the greater that affirmation, uh, the, the impact of that will be. If Jesus is who he's claiming to be, the king of all kings, then he is someone great enough to give us an extremely powerful affirmation. The question would then become, well, what does he think of us? Does he value us? And the answer to that is yes, more than you can imagine. We know that's true because of what he goes on to say. In verse 31, Jesus says, the son of man must suffer. The son of man must suffer. Now, when Peter hears this, uh, we're told he took Jesus aside and began to uh, tell him off. Peter's image of the Messiah is of a, a king riding victoriously into Jerusalem, establishing his kingdom and sitting on a throne. And Jesus is effectively saying, I am going to Jerusalem and I am going to establish my kingdom, but I'm not going to a throne. I'm going to a cross. A cross? Now, when we hear about the cross, it doesn't affect us, does it? For us, the cross is just a, a religious symbol. But the cross is the epitome of helplessness and shame. Those being executed were, were crucified naked with their arms nailed open for all the world to see. It is the exact opposite of a throne. Jesus is saying, I am the king, but I'm not coming to take power. I'm going to lose it. I'm not coming in majesty, but humility. I'm not coming to a throne but to a cross. I'm not coming to rule, but to suffer. Now you might ask, how does that bring affirmation for us? Well, it comes when we understand why Jesus says that he must suffer. Why does he say that? Why does Jesus say he has to die? That is a really important question. Uh, and I want to give you two brief answers, two overlapping reasons. Our sin and his love. At the beginning of Mark's gospel, there's a story uh, about four men who bring their paralyzed friend to Jesus. They want him to heal their friend. If you've seen the Mark drama, you'll remember the scene with the man being lowered down through the ceiling right in front of Jesus. And Jesus says something quite shocking. He says to the man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now he says that not because he doesn't see the man's need of a physical healing, but because he sees the man's deeper need for forgiveness. Now, as you read Mark's gospel, and, and I really hope you'll do that. You'll take away the copy that you got today. And, and if possible, I'd really encourage you to do that with a Christian friend, to read through slowly and try and understand uh, what we're being told about Jesus. But, but let me give you a, a kind of heads up and, and a, 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 a tip for reading Mark. As you read through the whole story, you need to read it with the cross in view. Because if you like, the, the cross casts a shadow over the whole story. And that is true for this story of the paralyzed man because the only way Jesus can say to him, your sins are forgiven, is because Jesus knows in just a short while he will carry that man's sins on himself when he dies on the cross. You see, here's the truth about forgiveness. It always involves suffering. There's always a debt to be paid. We know this from our own experience. If someone wrongs you, then you have a choice. Either you make them pay or you pay. You know, for example, someone breaks your phone. You have a choice. Either you make them pay for it so you can replace it or you pay for it. You might say to your friend, oh, it's nothing. Don't worry. It wasn't that expensive. I forgive you. But in saying that, can you see you're absorbing the cost yourself? 
Now that's a crude example. The, the, the same goes if someone injures your uh, reputation. Either you make them pay, you try and get back at them, or you uh, absorb the cost, the pain of that yourself. But can you see that there's always a cost? There's always a debt to be paid. And if you're going to forgive someone, you're saying, I'll pay the debt myself. Jesus says in Mark 8 that he must suffer because, friends, that is the payment for our forgiveness. The only way Jesus can deal with the sins of humanity and make forgiveness possible is if he suffers. And here's the sobering thing that we learn here. Our sin, the the ways that we have uh, rejected God and offended him are serious. Really, really serious. For God to forgive us, he has to pay the debt. And the payment that is required is death. The only way that you or I can be forgiven is if someone dies in our place. And for me to be forgiven, you can't die in my place because you've got a debt that needs to be paid as well. The only person who can die for me is someone who's innocent, who doesn't deserve to die themselves. And the only person who fulfills that criteria is Jesus Christ. The night before Jesus dies on the cross, he's in the garden of Gethsemane and he is praying. He's praying to his father and he's in anguish. He prays, if there is any other way, then let this suffering be taken away from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Jesus is looking ahead to the suffering that he's going to endure on the cross. And he is recoiling from it. And he's asking if there is any other way for forgiveness to be achieved. And the answer is no. The only way for our sins to be forgiven is if Jesus pays our debt, carries our sins on himself and suffers in our place. Now you might ask, but why did he have to do that? Why did he have to forgive us? If we've all got a choice, whether we forgive someone or not, doesn't God have a choice? Well, yeah, he does. But then again, he doesn't. You know, certainly there's nothing in us that compels him to treat us with such kindness. But there is something in him. Love. And the love that God has for you and for me does compel him, compels him to to seek our good and secure our forgiveness. His love comes not because we're especially loving, but because he is incredible, not because we're especially lovable, but because he is incredibly loving. God wants his relationship with you restored so badly that he's willing to go to the cross. That is how much God values you. That's how much worth he puts on you that's how much he loves you I have a son Jacob and he is three today and he's very excited I love him to bits and there is no way in the world that I would give him up for any of you I just don't love you that much the awesome truth of Christianity is that God does God loves you so much that he gave his only son to die in your place. See, your worth ultimately is what you're worth to God. And that is a very great deal because Christ died for you. When I first heard that, first kind of understood what God had done for me, it changed my life. I was 14 Uh, I'd grown up in the church, always believed in God. But for me, God was pretty abstract, didn't have uh, much of an impact on my life. When I was 14, I I heard, or at least understood for the first time, that God was a personal God and that he wanted a relationship with me. And, And the whole reason Jesus had come into the world and the whole reason he died on the cross was to make that relationship possible. That Jesus had taken my sin and died in my place. That he had been treated as I deserve. 
so that I could be treated as he deserves, welcomed by God and adopted as his child and embraced in his love. When I was 14, I, I was really impacted by that. And I knew that I couldn't just turn my back on a God who'd loved me that much. This is the heart of the Christian message. It says to us that we are so sinful, Christ had to die for us. That was the cost of our forgiveness. But it says simultaneously that we are so loved, he was glad to die for us. He willingly endured that suffering in our place because he loves us so very much. This truth about Jesus is the center of reality. This is what you need to know and believe to find true life, to find true hope, to find a secure and satisfying identity. You need to know that Jesus is the king who went to the cross and in his great love died in your place. That's the challenge of seeing Jesus' identity. Finally, there's the call. The call to find your identity in him. If we take Jesus up on his offer and we shift our sense of identity and worth from whatever it's currently in and we come to him and we find ourselves in him, what, what will that look like? Well, it will mean accepting that I'm one for whom Christ died. It will mean accepting that I am so sinful he had to die for me, yet so loved he was glad to die for me. It will mean accepting that, that I'm a forgiven sinner, but also a loved child of God. Now, notice how different this is to a performance-based identity, any performance-based identity, because if we find our identity in Jesus, it is utterly secure and it is infinitely satisfying. It's utterly secure because it's not based at all on anything we do. It's based entirely on what Jesus has done for us. It's utterly secure and it is infinitely satisfying because... You are loved and approved. Your, your affirmation comes from God himself. There is no one greater who could give you their approval. The one person in the universe whose opinion really matters says, I love you. I love you. And my love for you is not conditional on anything you do. When you grasp who Jesus is and what he's done for you, it changes you. The old approach to identity is gone and you're motivated at a heart level to, to live your life, to give your life for the one who gave his life for you. This is the Christian life that Jesus calls each of us to. It's there in verse 34. He says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Being a Christian means following Jesus. It means submitting to him as your king. But you do that not to earn his love and approval, but because you already have it. You serve him because you love him. As we finish, let me just mention three quick things about the Christian life. It's a life of cost, a life of joy, and a life that leads to glory. A life of cost. Following Jesus means that we serve him as our king. You know, it's ironic, isn't it, that, that Peter says to Jesus, you're the Messiah, you're the king. And then just a few minutes later, he takes Jesus aside and tells him off, tells him he's got it wrong. You can't do that to your king, can you? If Jesus is your king, then you submit to him. You say, whatever you ask, I'll do. Wherever you send, I'll go. And whatever you bring into my life, I'll accept. The life of the Christian is not a life of ease and comfort. To follow Jesus means to walk the way of the cross. It's a life of surrender, a life of service, a life of suffering. If you're thinking about becoming a Christian, you need to count the cost. 
But the life of the Christian is also a life full of joy. Because the way of the cross is the way of Christ. One writer puts it like this. All the love I feel for Jesus attaches itself to the way of the cross. All the beauty that I see in Jesus attaches itself to the way of the cross. Why do I want to follow this hard road? Because it represents all that makes my saviour attractive. I want to be like him. Of course I do. He's so wonderful, so beautiful, so lovely. And to be like Jesus means above all else to walk the way of the cross. Christian life is a life of cost, a life full of joy, and a life, finally, that leads to glory. Just as Jesus' life was one of suffering followed by glory, so our lives, if we follow him, are characterized by suffering now, but glory later. In verse 38, right at the end of this passage, Jesus says that those who reject him in this life will face his rejection when he comes again. It is a warning. It's a warning that that though there is a cost to following Jesus now, the cost of rejecting him will be even greater. But the opposite is also true. Those who receive and follow Jesus in this life will experience his welcome and embrace. Friends, there's a day coming when the one who once died in our place on the cross, the one who calls us to serve and follow him in this life, will appear. And if we've come to him and found our life in him, then he will take us in his arms and enfold us in his love. He'll wipe away our tears. And we'll know beyond any doubt that whatever cost we faced in following him in this life was worth it. Jesus asks each one of us today the most important question we'll ever face. Who do you say I am? Only when we understand who Jesus is will we understand who we are and find an identity that is secure and satisfying. Jesus is the king who died on the cross to pay for our sin because of his great love. And he invites us to find ourselves in him. Thanks for listening. I'm going to be around afterwards. Please come and talk to me if you'd like to. I'm not scary. Uh, You might have questions. Or it might be that you want to take Jesus up on his offer. And I'd love to help you do that. There'll be other people here at the front as well. Uh, But again, thanks for coming.